Hi, everyone. My name is Shireen Mawazit, and I'm the Chief of the Diversity Outreach and Training Unit. And I'm joined next to me by Ashley Tees, who is the Deputy Chief of the Diversity Outreach and Training Unit. And today we're going to be speaking to you about retaliation. The two retaliation provisions under Title V. Um, so some of you know them as prohibited personnel practices. And today we're gonna cover um, a little bit of background about the Office of Special Counsel, which is the agency that we both work at, um, what our rules are, and then we're gonna dive into the two retaliation provisions and we're also going to answer some questions that were sent in advance um, from the community. So hopefully we can cover those. In addition to giving you some hypotheticals, um, I'm going to pause because, of course, we don't have a live audience today. Give you a moment or two to think about the answer and then Ashley or I will give you the answer. So let's go to the next slide. So here I'm, I'm going to cover just really quickly the background of the Office of Special Counsel. The agency OSC is an independent executive and investigatorial agency. And you see our primary functions up on the screen. What we'll be focused on today, again, are two of the 14 prohibited personnel practices, the two retaliation provisions. And you see our authorities there. Who does this law apply to under Title V? It applies to federal employees, former federal employees, and applicants for federal employment. So OSC accepts complaints from all of those folks. We'll talk a little bit. One of the questions is a little bit about our process. We investigate, determine whether there's a violation. And for most of our cases, when there is a finding of a violation, OSC will facilitate a settlement agreement between the employee who's filed the complaint and the agency against whom the complaint is filed. So that's our primary functions under the prohibited personnel practices. We also have authority over what's called a whistleblower channel. So you're gonna hear that term whistleblower twice, but that section of the statute 5 USC 1213 applies a little bit differently. Under that section, OSC does not investigate. Instead, the employees, the attorneys in that division determine whether there's a substantial likelihood of wrongdoing. So employees are alleging some type of government wrong, wrongdoing. If that substantial likelihood determination is met, then the, the allegation is set to the head of the involved agency for investigation. It's a very public process quite different than our prohibited personnel practice process. Then we have the Hatch Act, which all of us know governs our abilities to engage in political activity as federal employees. And last but not least, we all also have jurisdiction over USERA, which stands for the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act. And who does that apply to? That applies to members of the military, members of the National Guard, reservist and the process there is also different for those folks filing complaints they first have to file with an office called vets at the department of labor and typically they're alleging some sort of disparate treatment i was treated differently because of my membership in one of those military organizations Vets does the investigation then those employees are permitted to ask for their case to be referred to osc OSC can further investigate, and we also have litigating authority. So those are our authorities in a nutshell. Next slide. And actually, Shireen, there's some questions for you here. Um, so the first question here, although OSC has some unique authorities, neither statute, regulation, case law, nor policy appears to give OSC exclusive jurisdiction to investigate civilian whistleblower reprisal allegations. Would OSC confirm that federal agencies generally and their inspectors general specifically may investigate complaints of whistleblower retaliation? Yes, Ashley, um, that's a great question from those of you uh, out in the field. And the answer is, is yes, there is no exclusive jurisdiction. So OIGs, uh, agencies can investigate prohibited personnel practices. Thank you. 
And can you also provide an overview, an overview of OSC's investigative process for investigating physical retaliation? Is there a standard timeline? And specifically, what happens if OSC concludes that a violation did or did not occur? Sure, another great question. Um, so it, I'm going to give you just a, a kind of a quick overview of our um, process. So as I mentioned before, employees can file complaints. We have a complaint form on our website at uh, osc.gov. Those complaints are then pretty quickly turned over by our initial review division. That's called the complaints review division and then assigned out to one of um, four areas, either our headquarters office or one of our three um, field offices, depending on where the complaint is located. And it's assigned out to an attorney and or an investigator to investigate. What the timelines, you know, those questions are really difficult to answer, but I can tell you about 80% of the cases that we receive are uh, handled within 240 days. Then for those cases that do require a more involved investigation, um, as Ashley knows, we both have a background in our investigation and prosecution division. Those cases can take uh, significantly longer. It really is going to depend on the case. Um, the other thing I think you asked was a, a little bit more, what happens if OSC concludes that a PPP did occur so that there was a violation. As I mentioned before, typically um, the case attorney or investigator would reach out to one of our point of contacts at the agency that they've been dealing with during the investigation to see if the agency is interested um, in facility or in, in a settlement agreement. And um, that's probably happens in the majority of our cases. There are times, however, when there isn't a settlement reached and OSC does have the authority to file um, complaints with the Merit Systems Protection Board, either for corrective action or remedy for the employee or disciplinary action against the management official uh, who took the alleged personnel action. Thank you, Shereen. One final question for you. So does an employee have any other avenue of recourse if OSC um, closes a PPP complaint? Yeah, absolutely. So for the retaliation uh, provisions, which is quite different for the other prohibited personnel practice, because this is exclusively for the retaliation provisions, if um, OSC closes that complaint, then an employee does have the right to file what's called an individual right of action with the Merit Systems Protection Board. And there are a couple of different timeframes that apply um, when employees utilize that right. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I think we're on slide three and we're talking a little bit just about the definition of prohibited personnel practices. And uh, again, you see that up on the screen. Uh, we don't really need to focus on that much, but again, the two retaliation provisions are two of those 14 prohibited personnel practices. Let's move to slide four. So this one's a question for you all. Who can commit a prohibited personnel practice? So we have uh, five responses. A, anyone with personnel action authority. B, supervisors. C, political appointees. D says B and C, and E is all of the above. So I'll give everyone sort of a moment to think about that. And I'm sure many of you got this answer right. The answer is E, all of the above. Um, I always say there's a little bit of a caveat when it comes to political appointees because the actual statute says that you have to have personnel action authority and, and not all political appointees have personnel action authority but it can include all those different types of folks. So let's move to the next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we're just focused on the two retaliation provisions here, but you can see all the prohibited personnel practice listed. There are 14 um, and there is at some point gonna be another video where we discuss um, the rest of the provisions. And I have a question for you. So my understanding is that OSC does not generally review complaints 
when employees alleging discrimination under Title VII. But how does OSC handle cases where an employee has filed a retaliation complaint with OSC and also alleges that the actions at issue in the retaliation complaint evidence discrimination under Title VII? Um, does OSC request an investigator file? Do they communicate with the agency representative who's handled the email matter? So yeah, that, that's correct. There's no election of remedies requirement for an employee filing, for instance, a, a retaliation complaint as well as an EEO complaint. That election of remedies provision uh, applies to bargaining unit employees only. So in that, in that instance, um, we can both be doing our investigation right at the same time. There are different statutory standards under the two different Title V versus Title VII. Um, and yes, typically OSC um, may in fact ask for the EEO report of investigation if that's been done already. It's possible if, if it's pertinent or relevant, we may also ask um, to speak to someone who's involved in that case or circumstance. And, and a lot of times, if this were a case where, let's say, there was enough evidence to show a, val uh, a violation under the retaliation provision, um, many times our settlements will be global. So it could, in fact, also include uh, the Title VII claim. And that's usually something that agencies ask of us. So those are really great questions. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next slide, which just sort of sets out retaliation, and then we can move to the next slide. So here's kind of the main focus of our video today, and that's, you know, explaining to everyone what is retaliation, what are the elements, and then we've got some hypotheticals that we'll ask, and Ashley will be also um, peppering me with some questions <laughs> as we move along on the retaliation. So uh, first, retaliation. There are two provisions. Uh, employees, supervisors, those with personnel action authority may not retaliate against any employee for engaging in what we call whistleblowing, and I'll define that a little bit later, or for engaging in protected activities. There are two separate provisions. They do have in common, for the most part, the following four elements that you see on the screen. So for whistleblowing, an employee has to have a reasonable belief that they're disclosing information that falls under one of six categories, such as a violation of law, rule, or regulation. For retaliation for engaging in protected activity, that one's a little bit easier. Did the employee engage in that activity or not? So that's element one, right? Did the employee um, whistleblow or engage in protected activity? And also what you need to know is that the courts recognize both perceived whistleblowing and perceived protected activity. So let's say I'm someone at the office and I tend to have a big mouth. I like to talk about everything that's going on. Um, and my supervisor's convinced that I'm the one that engaged in the whistleblowing and she takes action against me when in fact it was Ashley who's um, quieter to follow all the rules. <laughs> so again, that perceived whistleblowing, perceived protected activity is recognized. The second element that's required is that a, there must be a personnel action taken, not taken, or threatened. And some of our hypotheticals going forward will dive into each of these elements so you have a better understanding of what they mean. Third, there has to be knowledge of the whistleblowing or the protected activity um, and there is a constructive knowledge argument that's also recognized by the courts and the case law. So, for instance, um, if I'm the first line supervisor and I don't have knowledge of the whistleblowing, but Ashley is the second line supervisor and she does have knowledge and convinces me to take the personnel action, that would be constructive knowledge for purposes um, of that particular hypothetical. Last but not least, contributing factor. So the whistleblowing or the protected activity have to contribute to the supervisor's decision to take, fail to take, or threaten to take that personnel action. And what does that mean? Well, again, we'll define that a little bit later in more detail, but even if 1% of my motivation is the fact that Ashley went and filed a complaint with the Office of Inspector General, Right, that meets contributing factor. 
So we'll, we'll talk about the different ways to meet contributing factor, but it is important to note there is something called the knowledge timing test, which means if there's evidence of knowledge of the whistleblowing or protected activity, and that personnel action, remember taken, not taken, or threatened, occurs within about a year, an employee will automatically meet the contributing factor test. So all those four elements have to be proven by what we call a preponderance of evidence. So if you wanna think about that mathematically, that's a little bit more than 50% of the evidence. Let's go to the next slide. So I simply would go back and define a couple of those elements a little bit more. Here's our opportunity to define whistleblowing. So remember, um, an employee has to have a reasonable belief that they've disclosed information that falls into one of these six categories. And as you can see, they're fairly broad. Um, we have some definitions next to the categories. Um, and just keep in mind, for those of you who might be managers or supervisors, um, it's really not important for you to determine whether someone's a bona fide whistleblower, right? For the managers or supervisors, we just wanna make sure that they're not taking uh, whistleblowing or protected activity into account, that they're focusing their personnel action decisions on performance or conduct. But let, let's dive a little bit more. What, what if I make a disclosure that the agency is violating a regulation and I really do have some evidence to show that it might be violated, but it turns out the agency looks into my allegation that that regulation was not violated. Could I still meet element one? Could I still be someone who's engaged in protected whistleblowing? And the answer is yes, right? It is a reasonable belief standard, um, both subjective and objective. Would someone with the same information known to the whistleblower, could they reach that same conclusion? So sometimes agencies kind of get stuck on, well, it, 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 that allegation was not entirely accurate. Again, we're looking at that subjective and objective test. Okay, let's go to the next slide. We call this side sort of our cheat sheet for whistleblowing. It just um, lists a couple things that are good to know. For instance, we just talked about one. The whistleblowing doesn't have to be accurate to be protected. We're looking at that reasonable belief standard. Um, my personal motivation, if I'm the employee, if, I, if it meets the, uh, the definition otherwise, right, my motivation doesn't matter. Really important here, there's no requirement that employees go through a chain of command. There's no requirement for whistleblowing um, that employees only inform certain people. Employees can go to anyone, including the media. Now, there are two exceptions, and if we go to the next slide, we're going to see those exceptions. And that includes when the disclosure, that whistleblowing, is barred from release by statute. Or, of course, when it's classified. Now, barred from release by statute, we've had a, a Supreme Court case um, several years ago that clarified that that really just means law, statute. It does not mean rule or regulation. So even if someone violates a rule, when they're whistleblowing, you're not gonna be able to discipline them unless that rule is somehow captured in a law, in an actual statute. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So here's uh, our, our first kind of list of questions for you. And I won't answer too quickly, so you can think about the answer yourself and then I'll give the answer um, after just 10 seconds or so. So the question is, is it protected? Is it protected whistleblowing? Did the employee have a reasonable belief that they were disclosing information in one of those six categories? The first one is, Amanda testifies to Congress about the backlog in treating PTSD patients. Is that protected? Well, for those of you who say yes, we're, we're gonna agree with you, right, Ashley? That, that's, <laughs> that's a yes. So a lot of these examples come from OSC cases. And, um, you know, that could be a couple of things, especially if it came from um, an employee 
you know, potentially at the Department of Veterans Affairs, that could be a danger to public health or safety. It could even potentially be gross mismanagement if that agency's mission is ensuring folks are treated in a timely manner. The second question, Mark informs the front office that its new strategic plan is not cost effective. Is that protected? Does it meet one of those six categories? Okay, for those of you who said no, actually, and I agree with you, that one probably doesn't rise to the level, right, of a gross waste of funds. Um, and again, we're, we're giving quick examples here. There's always a lot of facts in our cases and we'd have to review all of those facts. The third example, this one's a little bit long. Alice, a biologist, is upset that her boss opted to use a cheaper, less effective test for early detection of a contagious disease. She sends an email to the head of the agency lamenting the decision and arguing that her research proves it's dangerous. Is that disclosure protected? So for those of you who thought, yes, Ashley and I agree. Now, if you just focused on the first part of that hypothetical, it might be a no, right? It kind of sounds a little bit more like, is it cost effective? But when you look at that second sentence where she, Alice is talking about the fact that her research proves the test is dangerous, right? right we're then right in line with danger to public health or safety. So last but not least, Sam discloses that his supervisor, Bill, lacks the licensure required by federal and agency regulations to supervise their lab. Sam discloses this information after Bill denied him a promotion. Is Sam's disclosure protected? So for those of you who thought yes, um, Ashley and I agree. We think it's yes. And yes, we threw in that second sentence <laughs> just as an attempt to uh, kind of shift your focus, right? Because the question was, was the disclosure protected? We weren't looking at the other factors. Timing could certainly factor in if you were looking at, for instance, contributing factor. All right, let's move to the next slide. We have a, another hypothetical. I'm going to read it. And you can see there are some responses at the end. So in this hypothetical, and again, um, we're sort of focusing on the protected nature of the disclosure as well as um, some of the other elements. John, a cybersecurity specialist, has concerns about lax enforcement of information security procedures involving an agency-wide database. Although his supervisors have thus far ignored him, John is convinced that he's right and the problem must be corrected. John shares his concerns with a colleague in one of the departments where the lapses are occurring to raise the alarm. John's first line manager, Susan, learns about the communications and she believes that John leaks sensitive technology information. While the disclosure of the information by John was not in violation of any laws, Susan believes it violates agency policy and that John's not to be trusted. So she removes John's access to the database. So our question is, is Susan's action lawful? Hey, yes, we know. Give you a moment to think about that one. There's a lot packed into that hypothetical. Um, but for those of you who said no, again, we have a lot of facts in these cases. So this is just sort of a mini overview. We agree with you. Um, so it looks like John Wright made a protected disclosure. Typically um, information security procedures are captured in some sort of uh, law, rule or regulation. Uh, Susan knows that he made the disclosure. We did try to kind of convince you maybe she could take action against him because she felt that John's disclosure um, was a leak of sensitive technology information, but then we made it clear that nothing that he disclosed violated a law. Um, so we're going with it was still a protected disclosure. And then as far as the connection here, she specifically removed his access to the database because of his disclosure. Okay, let's move to the next slide. So we've been talking about whistleblowing, now it's time to turn to protected activity. 
So going back to earlier in our video, we said there are two retaliation provisions, right? Retaliation for whistleblowing, and then second, retaliation for engaging in protected activity. And what you see up on this slide are the four statutorily defined types of protected activity. You can see again, they're pretty broad, filing their grievance, um, contacting the Office of Special Counsel or the Office of Inspector General. I did that. Ashley is representing an OIG. <laughs> or even a component who's responsible for review or investigation. That was a more recently added um, amendment to the protected activity categories. And actually, Shereen, I do have a question for you. So is there a different burden if an employee makes disclosures pursuant to their job duties? Um, when would that burden apply? So um, there is a different burden. Uh, the typical standard, the one that we just saw up on the slide is contributing factor. Um, and there is a higher standard that's sometimes applied that's called in reprisal for. But there was a, an amendment to the statute under 2302 FT, F2 fairly recently where Congress made clear that that higher standard, that in reprisal for standard, only applies if the employee has uh, job functions that are principally to regularly investigate. So what we found was that there were some court cases that were saying that that higher standard is required um, even when an employee's routine job was not to investigate um, any type of wrongdoing. So again, it has been narrowly now uh, applied to those whose principal function um, is investigating allegations of wrongdoing. Great, thank you. Okay, I don't know if I mentioned this, but let's move to the next slide. So we're on slide 14. And so now that everyone um, is an expert on protected activity, let's, let's take a look at this hypothetical. This one says, has Dean engaged in protected activity? Dean, an IT specialist at a large federal agency, learns that his supervisor, Maggie, her niece, is working for the agency. Because Maggie oversees the IT department, Dean believes that Maggie was involved in hiring her niece. Dean files a complaint with the Inspector General. HR records demonstrate that Maggie's niece was hired by the Finance Department and, and she does not perform any IT functions. So we have two possible answers. The first is A, yes, Dean engaged in protected activity, or B, no. Dean did not have a reasonable belief that Maggie violated any statute, such as the nepotism statute. So for those of you who answered A, Ashley and I agree, you are correct, it is A. Um, I will tell you, we get a lot of folks who will answer B. Um, Ashley came up with this question. This is a really good one because what happens is people start to conflate the definition of whistleblowing, right? Where you have to have a reasonable belief that someone's disclosed wrongdoing with the definition of protected activity. But they do, both don't apply. For protected activity, again, just contacting the OIG, right? Just filing the complaint. It doesn't matter what the substance of that complaint is. That by itself is protected activity. And we've even sometimes seen um, that administrative judges at the MSPB get it wrong, right? They try to apply the whistleblower um, definition to protected activity, but these are quite separate. Okay, next slide. I, I always get this one a little bit wrong because it's a not, what is not a personnel action? I'm gonna read all of them and we're gonna pick one that's not a personnel action a supervisor who is a micromanager and is not friendly to the staff, a fully satisfactory performance appraisal rating, placing an employee on paid administrative leave, reassignment to a position within the same job series and identical pay, moving an employee from a window office to a cubicle or 
F, alerting, I'm sorry, altering someone's telework schedule from three days per week at home to one day per week at home. Something folks are not very happy with these days. So what do you think? Which is not a personnel action. Um, well, for those of you who responded A, we usually get a, a healthy response <laughs> from pointing out A. Um, that's correct. I mean, we're not we're not encouraging supervisors to be micromanagers or unfriendly. That is not going to meet the definition of a personnel action, which we're going to see when we go to the next slide, just slide 16. So I'm, I'm not going to read everything on this slide. You can uh, take your time at home and, and look at the definition. So, it, But it, it covers most things that you're going to see in an SF-50 or an SF-52. But it also includes, are you ready, a significant change in duties or working conditions. So if I were to move um, Ashley from a nice big window office to a full dark cubicle, right, that could be a significant change in working conditions. And I would never do that. <laughs> um, and we have some other kind of examples here. If the action is voluntary, right, that's not going to be a personnel action. But keep in mind, we can look at things like coerced resignation. Okay, let's look at. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. No worries. Another question for you. So, a supervisor has instructed one of their employees to complete a bi weekly status report of his or her assignments, um, which includes a table which organizes both current and pending tasks. Um, assuming this instruction was issued for a legitimate management reason, would this be considered a personnel action for the purposes of the retaliation provision under B89? More specifically, is this considered to be a significant change in duties, responsibilities, or working conditions? Great question, Ashley. Let, let me parse that out. So um, part of the question talked about, you know, assuming that the action was not retaliatory motive. We, we don't look at that when we're determining whether something's a personnel action, but you're absolutely right. Where would this potentially fall? It would potentially fall in the significant change um, in duties. Now, with just the facts that you provided, Ashley, I would probably lean against this falling within a significant change in duties but let me give you the caveat right because we're lawyers that's what we do i mean someone could if they had the evidence to show that it took me you know uh, almost six hours every week to complete that task because let's say that um format was just very difficult and, and writing down every specific thing that i did was that difficult right that that could start to look like a significant change in duties if it's really impacting your ability to get the rest of your work done. But again, my initial reaction, I don't know about Ashley's, is probably doesn't rise to the level, but I, we would need more information. Exactly. Okay. okay, let's go to the next slide. So we're on to um, the final element, which is, well, we, we kind of have combined two elements, the contributing factor, knowledge timing test. Remember we had so far, right? Did the employee engage in whistleblowing or protected activity? Was there a personnel action taken, not taken or threatened? Was there knowledge of that whistleblowing or protected activity? And then last, did that whistleblowing or protected activity, did that contribute to the manager's decision to take fail to take or threaten to take the personnel action. So we, we talked earlier about that knowledge timing test. That's actually in the statute, right? Uh, many, many years ago when uh, the whistleblower protection law was first passed, not one employee had won a case at the board. And so Congress was like, hmm, they rethought, they thought maybe we made this a little bit too difficult. You know, how does someone prove contributing factor? So that's why the knowledge timing test was added. Now, there is another way to meet contributing factor. And if we go to the next slide, that would be through circumstantial evidence, right? Because there's not always going to be evidence of the knowledge timing within that one year time frame. But we will be, if the case were with OSC, we would be reviewing the evidence, um, including 
things like statements of animus, retaliatory motive, or let's say um, Ashley's my supervisor and I've always done really well. Ashley likes me and she's always given me excellent performance ratings. And after I engage in whistleblowing, things sort of change, right? My ratings, maybe they don't drop down to fully satisfactory. Maybe it just goes to outstanding. Um, but I'm also maybe not being given the same assignments that I was given prior to my whistleblowing. So that sort of change in attitude, which results in some type of personnel action, is also something we would look at under circumstantial evidence of contributing factor. And, and inconsistent testimony, believe it or not, that's what we get a lot over the reason for the personnel action taken, right? If that testimony is not consistent, right, then it's really not going to meet the um, requirement that it be strong evidence supporting that personnel action. Okay, let's move to the next slide. So now that um, we are all experts under those four elements, uh, we're going to ask you all this hypothetical. Can, can Tom establish the four elements of a reprisal claim? And I have a second question, but I'll ask that one after we get to this first. So Thomas Miller is a GS9 HR specialist at the Department of Interior. Tom and his direct supervisor, Candace, sit in a secure area and he's the only employee who sees Candace arriving and leaving work. He handles the time in attendance. In July 2021, Tom tells his second line supervisor, Jerry, that Candace abuses agency time and attendance procedures. According to Tom, Candace arrives at the office at 9 a.m. every day and leaves at 4. However, her time cards list her arriving as 8. Now, here's a, a side note. Uh, Tom himself consistently arrives 30 minutes past his 8.30 a.m. start time two days of the week. In January 2022, Candace tells Tom that he should be more concerned about himself and not others. After that, she initiates a fact finding and proves that Tom is consistently late to work on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and she issues him a five day suspension in March of 2022. So remember, those dates are important. Why? Because we're looking at that knowledge timing test. So what does everyone think? Can, can Tom establish the four elements of a reprisal claim? I know this one's a little bit involved. Okay, so for those of you who um, said yes, Ashley and I agree. Um, and let me just quickly go through the elements. And remember that the standard is preponderance of evidence, which is not all that important, but I just do want to remind you of the different evidentiary standards. So first, does Tom have a reasonable belief that he's disclosed here a violation of law, rule, or regulation? And I think Ashley and I would agree, yes, those time and attendance procedures are captured um, in regulations. He's the one that sees uh, Candace coming and going and also views the actual records, right? So um, that would meet element one. Element two, uh, personnel action taken, not taken, or threatened. Well, here he got a five-day suspension, and we can agree most disciplinary actions are going to meet that definition of a personnel action. This one maybe you all um, disagreed on. I've heard that from some folks that I've given this hypothetical to. I don't know about Ashley. A knowledge of the whistleblowing. Well, we tried to infer that Candace had knowledge of the whistleblowing uh, when she said to him that he should be more concerned about himself and not others, um, trying to at least infer that she found out that he reported her um, potential violations of those time and attendance procedures. And so then that brings us to contributing factor. And remember, there are different ways to prove contributing factor, circumstantial evidence, or that knowledge timing test. And here, uh, Tom meets the knowledge timing test. A, because we believe there's evidence that Candace knew about Tom's whistleblowing, and then that personnel action, that five-day suspension, happened less than a year 
after Tom engaged uh, in whistleblowing, right? So that that's the contributing factor test myth. So my next question is, does Tom prevail in his whistleblower claim, right? So we, we have shown that he met those four elements, but does he prevail? And the answer, Ashley, Ashley knows the answer, is not necessarily. So he may be, or maybe not. So if we move to the next slide, once the four elements are met by a preponderance of evidence, then the burden shifts to the agency. Now the agency has a higher burden. They need to prove by clear and convincing evidence, for instance, that Candace would have suspended Tom for five days, even if he had not engaged in whistleblowing. And what you see up on the screen are what we call the car factors. Those are the factors that the Merit Systems Protection Board and, of course, OSC reviews when we're investigating a case to determine whether an agency can meet that higher burden, including the strength of the evidence supporting the personnel action. Um, existence of motive to retaliate. Now, here, I would argue that Candace has some motive to retaliate, right? Where someone is being reported directly for their own wrongdoing. The last uh, car factor that we look at is treatment of similar employees who are not whistleblowers. So in this case, we may have evidence to show how were other employees disciplined or not when they themselves engaged in some sort of wrongdoing when it comes to time and attendance. Now, you're not always going to have evidence or an agency may not always have an evidence for all three of those factors. Maybe there's only really strong evidence under one factor, the evidence supporting the personnel action, right? Agencies are, are sort of in the main, you know, the captain's seat when it comes to that evidence, they control most of that evidence. Nevertheless, there are times where cases uh, reveal that the evidence is quite weak here. Um, there isn't sufficient evidence to support the personnel action. What we would be looking at in a case like Tom is, you know, how were other employees treated, again, who may have violated the time and attendance procedures? We would also look at how is, how is Candace treated? I would look at that, right? She was reported for even a more significant uh, time and attendance violations than Tom. We would look at what initiated that fact finding that Candace did? Was that retaliatory motive? You know, has she ever done a fact finding even if she had suspicions of other employees with respect to their time in attendance? The, so those are all the types of factors that we would review in determining whether an agency can meet that higher burden, that clear and convincing burden. So now let's move to the next slide. Now we're turning to um, corrective action, what's called corrective action. What are the remedies for employees who file uh, prohibited personnel practice complaints? And typically, as you see on the screen, it is what we call a status quo ante remedy, which is putting the employee back in the position they would have been in had the retaliation not occurred. So, you know, for Tom, we're sending that five day suspension paying him for that amount of unpaid um, work that he received that suspension for to include things like uh, reasonable attorney's fees or even um, damages for pain and suffering, compensatory damages. And we certainly do see employees um, in recent years since that amendment was passed some, some time ago, including those damages alleging those types of damages for pain and suffering. We also can look uh, to provide some sort of systemic relief. Um, sometimes there isn't an actual remedy for the employee. Sometimes we have, you know, maybe someone in our human resources staff who might uh, file an allegation which really involves sort of a supervisor. So we could be looking at, you know, how do we retrain folks? How do we provide um, training for supervisors at the agency? Um, and then last but not least, if we go to our next slide, 
OEC also has the authority to seek disciplinary action against those managers or supervisors who violated one or more of the prohibitions. What's important to note here was that several years ago, there was another statutory amendment um, which required that when there's been a finding of retaliation, it's actually it involves three of the pro prohibited personnel practices, but for this purpose, we'll talk about the two retaliation provisions. When there's a finding of retaliation, um, that's been uh, one of those violations has been committed, then there is um, what, what we call a, a actual disciplinary action provision that's triggered and that requires uh, for a first violation, a proposed three day suspension and a second violation, a proposed termination. And there are five entities that can reach that determination. It includes the Office of Special Counsel, the Merit Systems Protection Board, the agency itself, which went back to one of the questions that Ashley asked, the Inspector General and an administrative judge. But you also see up on the screen all the potential um, actions that can be taken when disciplining a federal employee. So everything from a letter of reprimand up to removal. And Shreen, I have one final question for you as you get ready to close out. So how can managers respond to complaints effectively and, you know, prevent a potential situation where an employee feels that they, they need to maybe go outside of their agency to blow the whistle? So I think um, the best advice that we have here is at one of the things that we've seen at the Office of Special Counsel is when there's a breakdown in communication at the agency, whether that's between the supervisor and the subordinate or even senior leadership and, and a certain level of employees, that's where we see a heightened um, number of complaints potentially coming, might be from a specific office, not necessarily an agency. So, um, you know, how do you ensure that uh, communication is something that, you know, employees feel, for instance, I want Ashley to feel that if she were to make a disclosure, she would be protected uh, from retaliation. And what we um, typically advise for agencies and managers um, is to talk about it, right? One thing that to show that you're open to folks coming forward, and even if they're just, um, raising a dissenting opinion. Uh, it doesn't have to meet the legal definition of protected whistleblowing. Um, making sure in staff meetings that you raise, you know, here, here are your different avenues. If you ever feel like you can't go through your chain of command for whatever reason, because again, there's no requirement when it comes to whistleblowing that you use the chain of command, but sometimes employees have the concept that is required to remind them that they have the right you know, to go elsewhere, um, whether that's OSC or the OIG or even another office at the agency. So we find, you know, giving those reminders out at staff meetings from time to time and sort of giving the okay that that's one of their options. Like that's not necessarily a negative because the bottom line is the agency wants to make sure that those important disclosures are elevated to whomever they need to be elevated. Um, another thing that we focus on, you know, kind of along with communication is making sure that um, managers address when employees say, you know, I want to make a disclosure or I, I think I'm being retaliated against that they make sure um, and, you know, are open to those um, requests or even that conversation. And, and the main point that we try to make is just make sure that employees know what their avenues are. That's the most important thing. So, um, of course, they can always come to OSC, they can go to the OIG, or they can come to you, which they may have come to a, a particular supervisor or manager. So those are the types of advice that we give, you know, first and foremost, make sure there's good communication um, at the agency and that the agency is making folks aware of their rights under Title V. Thank you, appreciate that. Well, that wraps up our slides. If you look at the last slide, this is just the Office of Special Counsel 
um, phone numbers and website, as I mentioned earlier, you can access our uh, complaint form through our website, and that's going to kind of take you through both the prohibited personnel practices and that whistleblower channel. Um, it's a smart form, <laughs> so it's going to help you navigate that process. And most of the numbers that you see up on the screen, um, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but we cannot give advice on the prohibited personnel practices, legal advice. So we do have, you know, employees and even management officials who call up and say, hey, this is, you know, this is what's going on. Is this a prohibited personnel practice? And unfortunately, those phone numbers are really just to kind of navigate you to the right form or the right office. We can't give advice. One exception, the Hatch Act unit. So about 50% of the Hatch Act offices work is what they call advisory opinions and 50% co complaints. So they are specifically permitted under the, stat the statute um, to respond, whether it's a informal advisory opinion over the phone or a formal written advisory to someone who's you know, either themselves thinking about engaging in political activity or asking a general question. So that is all we have today. I want to thank everyone for their time and attention. Um, Ashley and I have had a fun time presenting and hopefully everyone's uh, learned a little bit about retaliation and the Office of Special Counsel's role in handling those complaints. Thank you very much.